Chapter 5 An Invitation to Dinner He belonged at home with his master. Nothing mattered except this, and he had to take his two friends with him through wild, unknown country. The three friends continued on their journey for the next few days with no new adventures or excitement. At night they slept in the woods, warm and comfortable under the leaves on the ground. At first, in the day, they often stopped and rested. The old dog was too weak to go far, but he got stronger every day, and after a week looked much better. In fact, he looked younger and healthier than at the beginning of the journey. Most of the time he was happy as he walked along with his friends. He was always hungry, but the skillful hunter, the cat, found food for him. But the Labrador really suffered. He had very little to eat. While the other two animals were resting, he always looked for food. When they played together, he sat away from them, nervous and uncomfortable. He could never forget his purpose. He was going home. He belonged at home with his master. Nothing mattered except this. And he had to take his two friends with him through wild, unknown country. They travelled along old country roads and sometimes straight through fields and woods. On good days they walked as many as twenty-five kilometres. The weather was fine, with warm, sunny days. This was a good thing, because the bull terrier's hair was short and thin. The Labrador's hair was flat and thick, and he never felt the cold like the old dog. The cat was enjoying the adventure, sometimes leaving the other two for an hour or more. They didn't worry, as he always returned. The days were warm, but the nights were cold, and the old dog suffered then. The leaves on the trees were quickly losing their colour. Many of the birds of the forest started to fly to warmer places in the south. Once they saw another bear, but it was fat and sleepy. It was sitting in the sun when the three friends saw it. It looked up lazily, but wasn't interested in them. But the cat looked angry for about an hour after this meeting. The animals didn't see any more human beings for days. Then one day, when the old dog was alone, he saw an old man. The terrier loved people, and his tail began to wag from side to side in welcome. The man was carrying a bag and talking quietly to himself. When he saw the old dog, he lifted his old green hat from his white hair. He smiled kindly at the terrier and said hello. The old dog started to follow him. Soon the cat followed too, and far behind them came the Labrador. After about a kilometre, they arrived at a small cabin and walked through the yard to the front steps. Here the old man put his bag down and opened the green door. He then invited his new friends to come in. The old dog walked in with the cat near his shoulder, then the man. The young dog waited outside, unsure at first, and then followed the others. A delicious, meaty smell filled the front room. The old man hung up his hat, walked over to the fire, and put on some more wood. 
he washed his hands and then looked in a pot on the stove. The three hungry animals watched him carefully. The man took four plates from a cupboard and put them on the table. As he put the food on the plates, the old dog moved nearer. The old man sat down, looked around the table and said, Please, sit down. The three animals sat down on the floor behind him and waited patiently. The old man ate slowly and carefully as the animals watched. Soon his plate was empty. Then he looked around the table and said in a surprised voice, You haven't eaten your food. He looked at the three full plates thoughtfully for a long time. Then he got up, picked up one of them, and ate all the food on it. He got up again and picked up the second plate. When that was empty, he ate the food on the third plate. His three visitors sat and watched. None of them moved. They never jumped up on chairs and ate at the table with the hunters or with Longridge. So they stayed politely on the floor and waited. But they felt very, very hungry. The old man sat at the table when the last plate was empty. He was lost in his private thoughts and forgot about his visitors. After some time, a bird flew in through the window and broke the silence. The old man got up, looked around, and noticed the animals by the door. He looked surprised and smiled down at them kindly. You must come more often, he said. Then he looked at the old dog. He was wagging his tail. Please say hello to your dear mother from me. He opened the door for the animals. They walked out through the yard and into the wood, their heads down and their tails low. None of them looked back at the old man. Chapter 6 Lost in the River a large piece of wood hit the cat on the head. He was swept under and over and over and was carried away down the river. The next day the travellers came down from the hills to a river which ran from north to south. It was very wide and deep. The Labrador knew that his two friends hated water. They didn't even like getting their feet wet. But they all had to get across to the other side. Luath tried to find a shallow part of the river. Once or twice he went into the water and swam around. He looked back at the other two, inviting them in. But they stayed on the side of the river, sitting close together. In this lonely, wild country... There were no human beings and no bridges. The young dog continued searching for an easy place to cross. But the river got wider and wider, and after four or five kilometers he lost patience. He ran into the water and swam quickly and strongly to the other side. He loved the water and felt completely comfortable in it. He stood on the other side of the river, looking back at the old dog and the cat. He barked loudly, but they looked nervous and afraid. At last, the young dog swam back to his friends and waited in the shallow water. The terrier joined him, but he was shaking with cold and fear. 
Once again, the Labrador swam across the river, climbed out onto the far side, shook himself, and barked. His bark meant, you too must follow me. Come on, it's easy. The old dog stepped into the water. The Labrador swam back to help him. This happened three times, and the third time, the old dog walked into the river up to his chest. Then he started swimming. He wasn't a very good swimmer. He held his head high out of the water, and his little black eyes looked scared. But he was a brave bull terrier, and he continued following the Labrador. At last he reached the other side and climbed out onto dry land. He ran around happily, lay on his back, and dried himself in the long grass. Then he joined the Labrador at the side of the river and barked at the cat. The poor cat now showed the first signs of fear on the journey. He was alone and didn't want to swim across this terrible river. But he had to join his friends on the other side. He ran up and down, crying out to the other two animals. The young dog swam back and waited in the water. After a long time, the cat suddenly decided to cross. He ran into the water and started swimming toward the Labrador. He was a surprisingly good swimmer, quickly reaching the middle of the river. But then a terrible accident happened. There was an old dam on a smaller stream that ran into the river about three kilometers away. It was built from small trees and pieces of wood and wasn't very strong. Suddenly it broke, and a wave of water poured into the river and hit the two animals. The brave young dog tried to protect the cat, but he was too late. The wave passed over them, and a large piece of wood hit the cat on the head. He was swept under and over and over, and was carried away down the river. The old dog barked wildly on the side of the river. Then he jumped into the water and swam. He tried to save the cat, but the water knocked him back, and he had to swim to the side again. The young dog was a strong swimmer, but he swam with great difficulty. The river carried him a kilometer before he could put his feet down. When he reached dry land, he quickly climbed out onto the grass. He ran down the side of the river, looking for the cat. He could see his little body, half underwater. But he was never near enough to catch his friend. Soon Luath was far behind and couldn't see Tao at all. He came to a place where steep rocks formed the side of the river. The path took him high above the water. When it came down again, there was no sign of the cat. It was almost dark when the Labrador returned to the Tarrier. Bodger was walking toward him along the river, tired and unhappy. The Labrador was exhausted, too. He greeted the old dog and then dropped to the ground. He only got up when he needed a drink. They spent that night by the side of the river. They lay close together to get comfortable and warm. When a thin, cold rain fell, they moved under an old tree. In the middle of the night, the old dog sat up, shaking with cold. He threw his head back and cried out to the heavy black sky. 
He missed his dear lost friend. He wanted to see him by his side again. At last, the young dog got up sadly, and the two started their lonely journey again, away from the river and over the hills to the west. Chapter 7 A Loving Family This cat's been in the water for a long time, he said. He's very weak. Shall we try to save him? Many kilometers down the river, there was a small cabin with beautiful red flowers in the windows and a blue front door. Vegetables grew in the yard, and there were apple trees and green fields around the house. Reino Normi and his wife lived here. They came from Finland and had a ten-year-old daughter, Helvi. Life was hard in this wild place near the forest. But the Nurmis were strong people. They worked hard and had a good, simple life. They ate the food that they grew. They caught fish in the river and sold wood. Unlike her parents, Helvi was born in Canada. Every day she walked through the lonely country to the school bus. And every afternoon, when she came home, she told her parents about life outside their small farm. One Sunday afternoon, Helvi was playing down by the river. She was throwing stones across the water. She was lonely and wanted a friend to play with. Suddenly, a big wave came past. Helvi was safe because she wasn't standing in the river. She stood and watched, then saw something strange. What was it? It looked like a small, wet body. It turned round and round in the water and was then pushed onto the rocks. Helvi ran along by the water to look more closely. Then she shouted out to her mother. Mother! Mother! Come here quickly! There's a strange animal in the river. It's caught in the rocks. Mrs. Normi was out in the yard, planting vegetables. She hurried down to the side of the river, calling to her husband at the same time. He followed her, walking calmly with a quiet, thoughtful face. They all looked down in silence at the small, thin body on the rocks. Then Mr. Normie put his hand lightly on it and pulled back the skin above and below one eye. He turned and saw Helvi's worried face close to his. This cat's been in the water for a long time, he said. He's very weak. Shall we try to save him? Helvi and her mother both wanted to save the poor animal. So Mr. Nurmi picked up the wet cat and walked back to the cabin. He put the cat down in a sunny place by the fire and dried him. Then Helvi's mother opened his teeth and Helvi poured a little warm milk into his mouth. The cat shook, cooked, and some milk came out of his mouth. Mr. Nurmi pressed his body. The cat coughed again and a stream of river water came out of his mouth. Then he lay down and went to sleep. Mr. Nurmi smiled happily. Keep him warm and quiet, he told Helvi. But are you sure you want a cat? Oh, yes, answered Helvi, as she looked down at the sleeping animal by the fire. Her mother went into the kitchen to make supper. Her father left to feed the chickens. Helvi sat by the cat and watched patiently. Sometimes she put her hand near the fire and touched the soft, warm body. 
After about half an hour, the cat woke up. Helvi looked closely into the bright blue eyes. The cat looked back and slowly started to move. Very excited, Helvi called to her parents. After another half hour, she was holding the Siamese cat in her arms. Then she gave him some milk. He usually hated milk, but he drank it quickly. Then he started washing himself from head to foot. As the Nurmi family ate their supper, he finished a bowl of meat. Then he walked around the table legs, asking for more food, his tail straight in the air. Helvi thought he was wonderful. That night the Nurmis were having fresh fish. It was cooked in the country way with the head still on, in a soup with potatoes. Helvi put the head with some soup and potatoes into a bowl and placed it on the floor. The cat ate everything, holding the bowl down with his paws. Happy at last, he lay down near Helvi's feet and went to sleep. For the first time in her life, Helvi had her own pet. Helvi carried the cat up to bed with her. He lay on her shoulder as she climbed the steep stairs to her little room at the top of the house. She put him into the old wooden bed that she slept in as a baby. He went to sleep there happily. Late in the night she woke up when the cat climbed on her back. The weather outside was cold, wet and windy. Helvi got up to shut the window. Then she lay down again and felt the warm, comfortable body of the cat on her bed. When Helvi left in the morning for the long walk and ride to school, the cat lay by the window. His hair shone in the sun as he washed himself sleepily. His eyes followed Mrs. Nurmi as she moved about the cabin. She went outside with the washing and looked back at the cat. He was standing on his back legs, looking out at her. His mouth was opening and shutting behind the window. She ran back, opened the door, and he followed her to the washing line. He sat by her and then followed her around the cabin and yard all morning. When she shut him in the cabin once by mistake, he cried out loudly. He followed the Nurmis around all day. Why is he watching us all the time? Mrs. Nurmi asked her husband. Maybe he needs to be near people. But her husband noticed the worried look in the cat's blue eyes. When a bird flew near him, he didn't look up. No, it's because he can't hear, Mr. Nurmi said. I think the poor cat's deaf. Helvi ran most of the way home across the fields. When she saw the cat, she picked him up. He sat on her shoulder while she helped her mother with the supper. She saw that her father was right. The cat was deaf, and his ears didn't turn toward any sound. After supper, her parents sat by the fire, and Helvi read to them. Because they were Finnish, they couldn't read English. But Helvi learned English every day at school, so she helped them with the new language. They sat and rested, with the cat near their feet, and listened to the child's soft voice. She had a book about Siamese cats, Great, proud Siamese cats from all over the world. As they listened, they looked down at their visitor. 
he lay in front of the fire with his tail sometimes moving. His beautiful blue eyes watched their daughter's hand as she turned the pages of the book. They touched his soft body and wonderful tail. Then Helvi gave him a bowl of milk. He drank it proudly, like a king, before she carried him upstairs to bed. That night, and for one more night, the cat lay happily in Helvi's arms. In the day, team, while she was at school, he followed her parents everywhere. He walked close to her mother as she looked for wood in the forest. He sat at her feet on the front steps as she prepared vegetables in the sun. He followed Mr. Nurmi and his workhorse across the fields. And in the late afternoons, when Helvi came back from school, he was waiting for her. He was one of the family. But on the fourth night he changed. He didn't seem comfortable on Helvi's bed. He shook his head and cried out unhappily. At last he lay down and pushed his head into her hand. She noticed that his ears were moving. He could hear every sound in the night outside. She was happy that he wasn't deaf any more. Soon she fell asleep. When she woke up later in the night, the bed felt cold. She saw the cat near the open window, looking out over the pale fields at the tall, dark trees below. His long tail moved from side to side. She put out her hand, but he suddenly jumped out of the window onto the soft ground below. She looked down and called out. His head turned for the first time to her voice. His eyes shone in the moonlight, and then he turned away. She realized sadly that he was leaving. He didn't need her now. Crying, she watched him go into the night. He walked toward the river. Soon the running shadow of the cat was lost in the other shadows. Chapter 8 A Cat Fight Suddenly, every hair on his back stood up. He could hear and feel an animal behind him. And it was not far away. The cat was a fast traveller. Only the rain slowed him down. He hated the wet and hid under a tree with his ears back. When the rain stopped completely, he came out. He walked uncomfortably through the wet grass and often shook his paws. Without his noisier friends, the dogs, the curious cat saw everything. He watched the forest animals, but they couldn't see him. When he met an animal face to face, it turned away. He only slept a little, up in the trees. He was a smart and skillful traveller, afraid of nothing. Early on the second morning of his travels alone, he went down to a lake to drink. He suddenly saw two men on the side of the lake with guns across their knees and a dog. The men called out to him, but the cat didn't look up. He put his pink tongue in the water and drank slowly. Both men called out again, amused by the cat. At last, he looked up, shook each paw, and calmly walked away. Behind him, the men started laughing as the proud cat continued his journey. The two dogs felt very sad as they traveled without the cat. Tao was the terrier's oldest friend, and he missed him a lot. The Labrador loved the cat, too, but Tao and Bodger were special friends. 
The two dogs tried to hunt for food, but without the cat's help, they didn't do very well. One day they walked near a farm. The young dog didn't want to meet any human beings, but he was hungry. They crossed an open field to steal one of the farmer's chickens. Suddenly, they heard an angry shout and saw a man at the far corner of the field. A black farm dog was with him. It ran to attack them. The Labrador was a terrible fighter and was hungry and weak. He was on his back with the farm dog on top of him. When brave Bodger jumped at the farm dog's neck, he knocked him over. The farm dog struggled to his feet, and the terrier knocked him over again. Then he turned and proudly walked away. The farm dog, usually very brave, stood up shakily. His neck was covered in blood. He ran away toward his master. The farmer watched the two dogs running away across the field with one of his chickens. "Come back here!" he shouted angrily, but the dogs were too far away. Bodger felt stronger and braver after this fight. That evening, he caught a small animal and had a delicious supper. Luath was badly hurt, but he seemed happier too. Maybe it was because he could feel the west wind. Memories of home came back to him. He knew that every day, every hour, they were getting nearer. The cat was following the Labrador and the old terrier. He knew which way to go. He could smell his friends clearly. But he began to feel nervous and afraid. Something was wrong. Something bad was following him. He started to walk through the forest more quickly, looking for the blue sky and open country far in front of him. Suddenly, every hair on his back stood up. He could hear and feel an animal behind him. And it was not far away. The cat jumped up into a tree and looked down. There, moving silently through the forest, was a huge cat. And it was very different from an ordinary cat like Tao. This one was almost twice as large, heavy, with a short tail and thick legs. Its coat was soft gray. And darker in some places, it had the wild face of a killer, much stronger and faster than Tao. It was a lynx. Tao quickly climbed to the top of the tree. The lynx heard him and stopped suddenly. It looked up, lifting one heavy paw. Its terrible eyes shone angrily. The cat looked around nervously. Searching for a way to escape, his tail moved from side to side, and he made a low, scared noise. Then the lynx started climbing the tree toward the cat. As its heavy body came nearer, the tree moved dangerously. The cat found it difficult to hold on. Then the lynx attacked with its great paw. The cat hit back. The tree moved wildly, and the cat fell to the ground. He heard the lynx land near him, got up fast, and ran for his life. Almost immediately, he heard the lynx close behind him. The cat couldn't turn and fight. This was a dangerous enemy, not a stupid bear. As he ran away, he knew it was hopeless. Every time the cat climbed up a tree, the lynx followed. Its great size shook the tree, and the cat fell off again and again. Then he saw a hole in the ground, 
and ran into it. The hole was too small for the lynx to follow. It lay on the ground and looked into the hole with one terrible green eye. But it soon moved back when some earth hit it in the face. The cat's back legs were working hard, throwing earth out of the hole. The lynx sat back and thought. There was complete silence in the forest. Deep in the hole, the cat waited, too scared to do anything. Suddenly, the lynx began to push the earth around the hole to one side with its huge paws. It didn't hear a young boy behind it. The boy was wearing a bright red jacket and carrying a gun. He was hunting, so he walked softly. Suddenly, he saw the wild animal at the entrance to the hole. At exactly the same time, the lynx saw the boy. It made a terrible noise. No fear showed in its angry eyes as it moved toward the boy. In a second, the boy lifted his gun and shot, all in one quick movement. The lynx turned over in the air and fell. It hit the ground and lay there, dead. The boy was shaking as he moved toward the dead animal. He couldn't forget the crazy look in the lynx's eyes. He looked down at it with a pale face, but he couldn't touch it. The boy's faither hurried toward his son. He stopped suddenly when he saw the huge body on the ground and his son's white face. The man turned the animal over. Look, son, he said to the boy, smiling. Look at that hole. That's where you shot it. The boy smiled back, still shaking. Tie this red cloth on the tree, son, said his father. Then it'll be easy to find. We'll come back later. The boy tied the cloth tightly on the tree and looked down at the lynx one more time. Then father and son walked away together, talking excitedly. The hidden cat could hear their voices for a long time. When everything was silent, he came out of his hiding place into the sun. He was tired and dirty. He didn't look at the dead body once. He calmly walked around it, sat down near it, and started washing his body from the end of his tail to his nose. Then he continued on his way, as calm and proud as always. Two days later, the cat found the two dogs. He came down a hill into a valley and suddenly saw his dear golden and white friends on the other side of a small stream. His tail moved in excitement. He opened his mouth and cried out. The two dogs stopped immediately, listening to the unbelievable sound in the valley. The cat jumped up onto a rock so that they could see him clearly. The young dog started to bark loudly and hurried across the stream. The old dog followed and the cat began to run too. They met near the little stream, all of them very excited. In his happiness, the old dog knocked the cat over twice with his head. The cat ran straight up a tree and then dropped down onto the old dog's back. The young dog stood there, slowly wagging his tail. When the old dog was too tired to move, the Labrador walked up to the cat. Tao stood on his back legs and put his chocolate-colored front paws on the great dog's neck.
That night, the three friends were happier than any other animals in the world. They lay close together under an old tree near the stream. Bodger had his dear cat, warm and loving, between his paws again. Lueth stopped worrying. His friend was back, and he could continue the journey with a lighter heart.